Okay, and we are back for the final, the last session in our graduate seminar on cultural policy in Munhua Zhengcheck. This one is a little bit out of cycle, perhaps. It would have been nice to do a couple of weeks ago, but we've all been busy. It is already July. The weather's hot. I'm wearing a loose, open-colored shirt. And the window is open in my house, and I'm not wearing a headphone because that's hot. So hopefully background noises won't be too much of a problem. I'm going to talk a little bit louder and hopefully a little bit slower. Alright, so let's get started. This recording is actually perhaps something that would be better with two recordings, one short. But as you know, in our university setting, lectures should be a certain length or else they don't count. So uh, instead of the 15 minute or 10 minute mini lecture that I prefer, we have to do longer lectures. So in this time we have basically two lectures together. Now, as you know, when you're watching in the CTL, if you stop the video, then you have to start over from the beginning or your viewing doesn't count for attendance. So please find the time you're going to need about, oh, maybe 65 minutes to start and finish this video lecture. So the two parts. The first part is who chooses art? Here we're looking at the term art very expansively, very broadly. We're including all of the ideas in culture that we have discussed in the past. So that could be the fine arts, the high arts, things like paintings and sculptures. Uh, it includes things like plays and opera, concerts. But it also includes pop art, things like popular music. And it can include, for the purposes of this discussion, things like the museums or the special exhibitions that are arranged in order to showcase art. And it also includes historic assets, things that we might dig out of the ground from 300 years ago or 2,000 years ago. All of that is being included in the idea of art here. The second part of this lecture is examining historical and cultural museums and assets and events, including festivals. So we're looking at these kinds of museums, assets and events related to history and culture, specifically looking at selection, finance, ownership, and management. That means the selection of historical events, for example, or the financing of cultural museums, or the ownership of a cultural asset, and the management. Okay? And we could call all this in one idea the economics of culture. Now I know that I have talked about culture and economics several times during this semester more in one particular lecture than in some others, but economics is what makes culture possible. You know, money makes the world go around. So here, we're going to spend some time talking about the economics of, in particular, events and museums. The focus this time is events and museums. So, let's start with who chooses the art. Who chooses the art? Well, we skipped one. Much of this section I'm going to talk about comes from the book Arts and Economics by Bruno Frey. Look at the picture. Why would I have a picture of Psy in terms of who chooses the art? Well, if we try to think about who chooses the art, we can break it down into 
a few groups. The first big group we'll call the people. We live in a democracy. People can vote, right? Who gets to vote? Well, in the political setting, usually we reserve the right to vote to certain classes of people. For example, you must be an adult, a certain age. Maybe that age is 18, or 19, or 17, or 21. But you have to be a certain age. Next, we usually say that you can't have committed a high crime. That if you have been to jail for three years, you've lost the right to vote. That's pretty much true in most countries. There are other things that we have looked at in the past, and some countries still do today, in terms of who can vote. For example, about 100 years ago, in many countries, women could not vote. Women could not vote. Similarly, whether through law or through practice, there were often minority groups that could not vote. Perhaps they were considered not citizens. And even now today, in Korea, I'm not a Korean citizen. But I can vote in local elections, but I cannot vote in national elections. So we've defined certain classes of people who can vote. And other classes in the past included things like, did you own land? If you were a landowner in the district, you could vote. If you didn't own land in the district or the country wherever the voting took place, if you were not a landowner, you couldn't vote. Or you had to pay taxes. If you didn't pay taxes, you couldn't vote. So who can vote? We make these decisions. The second issue is that what is popular today might be viewed as not worth preserving, not worth saving. That maybe Psi is not something we want to save for future generations. Or maybe it is. These are the kinds of questions. What is it that the vote is? Is the vote right? Do people make good choices? Okay, maybe we don't want to count voting at the ballot box. Maybe that's too difficult for this. So, there are others who argue that the commercial market is the best way for people to vote. If they like it, they'll buy it. That's the theory. But we have the same concern there that perhaps the commercial market is supporting something that's not really art. Was size performance art? It was entertaining. It was entertaining. I enjoy it. But is it art? That's the question that some people will ask. Okay, let's say it's not the democracy through the people, direct democracy, that we're going to use to choose art. What are some other choices? Well, the second choice would be for the elite to choose for us. So, who would be considered the elite? Well, the first possibility would be elected politicians. They are a super class of people who were voted by the common people, the everybody. And those politicians have a responsibility to make decisions for the wider democracy. That's why we elect them. They are representatives. What are our concerns about politicians? Well, Politicians are supposed to respond to the masses, to the electorate. So in this way, we could say these politicians are representing the common people that we looked at as group one. On the other hand, very often we understand that politicians are more likely to be responding to interest groups. For example, people who can pull together lots of votes, or people who can pull together lots of money for an election, or people who maybe will be able to provide a job after politics. So these special interest groups, and we're going to talk about those next. The elite can include special interest groups such as the culture and arts administrators inside of government. 
those bureaucrats and appointed administrators, you know, the president chooses somebody to be the minister of culture, arts, and sport, culture, ministry of culture, sports, and tourism, right? And there's the, the appointees below them. Also, managers of government-funded agencies and managers in government-funded nonprofits and NGOs. So we have those organizations directly controlled by government, often called agencies. Uh, in Korea, we have uh, certain levels of divisions of these organizations. And in UK, it's called QUADO, quasi-autonomous government organizations. And then Quango, which is quasi-autonomous, non-governmental organizations. But both of those we could call government agencies. Okay, Organizations which are directly or indirectly pretty much controlled by government. And then we have those NGOs, which in America we're more likely to call non-profits. But they get money from government. And so therefore uh, they have a close connection to government. And so government might ask these organizations to make decisions for us. Well, these administrators are typically well-educated in the arts. That's how they got their job. Or they've worked their way up an organization and they are self-educated. But anyway, they supposedly know about arts. The downside is that these administrators over time develop their own connections and sentiments and they feel like that's art and that's not. They've spent years working in a particular field of art and that's what they want to support. It's what they've always supported, it's what they want to support. So there's a kind of a bias there. Now it might be a bad bias, it might be a slight bias, but we have to understand that these people are long-term professionals related to the arts and they will have their favorites and those favorites might not match the popular democracy the common people another type of elite would be the art establishment okay. the art critics who write in newspapers historians perhaps they're academics Gallery owners and buyers, the people who buy and sell arts. Private and corporate collectors and investors. Now, the difference between a collector and investigator and investor is a very fuzzy line. Someone will buy something because they are a collector, they're a, an art lover, and they buy uh, a painting that they expect will go up in value over time. But in the meanwhile, they can enjoy it themselves. So that could very often be. So they could be both a collector and an investor. But there are people who are purely investors. They buy something and it immediately goes into a lock uh, facility where it's protected. And they're just holding it because they expect it will go up in value. Just like somebody who buys uh, silver coins. right? We expect in the future the price is going to go up. I buy silver coins. I have a lot. And then we have the collectors who are mindless of the value. They just expect that it will go uh, up or down or whatever. They don't care. It's theirs. They have this art. Right? So we have collectors and investors, both on the private sector, individuals, and on the corporate sector. Walk into some big, big, big corporate business headquarters, and it's not unusual to find fine art whether that is sculptures or paintings, uh, perhaps in the main entry lobby, probably up on the executive floors, some other areas. So businesses buy art. And again, part of that might be uh, investing. Part of that might just be the idea that we like having these kinds of uh, fine arts in our building that they inspire people. And some of it might be simply that they are supporting the art sector. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. So we have the art establishment, such as the critics and historians and gallery owners. But, again, 
this art establishment is probably going to be biased towards established forms. Things that everybody says, that's art. Things, famous painters, understood forms, uh, modern art, especially the things that you have to kind of look at and go, hmm, I wonder what that is. That took a while to build up a following, and still we hear about businesses that pay somebody to come out and put some new modern art out in front of the building, and then everybody wonders if that was a good choice. What is that thing? But in general, the art establishment, again, is biased towards the established forms. Not necessarily the established artist, but at least certain things that we recognize as art. On the other hand, the art establishment might be biased towards new forms that they think are exploitable. And to exploit means to take advantage of. In this case, it might be that I'm trying to build a new museum and I need something different. Right? And so this new kind of art is what we're going to do. It could be that the government is looking to support new forms of art. So whomever it is, people who are in the art industry could say, we're looking for something different and new. These are opposites, right? Established forms versus new forms. But the key with the new form is that somehow they think they can exploit it. They can make it grow, make it develop to their benefit. Okay. Another form of elite would be the artist the artists themselves. But which artists? And what do they choose? Well, artists tend to be biased towards their own preferred form of art. That is, a painter prefers to see paintings probably like sculpture less, and if we start talking about these kinds of giant things that take up space, or these temporary forms that are built for three days and go away, they probably don't like those kinds of arts. They may not like dance and music. They like painting. So artists tend to be biased towards their own forms. We have to ask, who's an artist? How do we decide you're an artist and you're not? Now, earlier in the semester, we talked about how uh, the government in Korea used to require artists to register. It was a way to kind of keep track of them during the Japanese colonization period and after that. And the artists who were accepted, joined the community and were accepted, were able to get government support and permission to do things. And the artists who didn't get included were excluded. They didn't get government money. They didn't get permission to put up their art displays. So how do we choose who's an artist? Is it a question of, we like the art? Is it a question of, you're a loyal citizen? You're, you're faithful to the government in charge? How do we decide who's an artist? Once we've decided that we're going to include certain artists, how will they vote? Do we call a hundred together into some kind of committee to make votes? That's often how funding programs happen. They may not have the final decision, but they have these committees to help make decisions. Do we have councils? If we have councils, how do we choose who's on the council? Right, so who is an artist? How do we collect their votes? Okay, we're almost done with this section. The last major grouping for who chooses the art is the market. Now, the market in this case is not the final consumer, is not the person walking into the store to buy. Okay? That is one of the measures we talked about under democracy. Here we're talking about the businesses that buy and sell. The businesses that ultimately sell to the final owner. That could be a gallery. That could be a record store. That could be, in terms of theaters, the people who are selling the tickets. 
ultimately the market is the final buyer but who is dealing with those final buyers and deciding okay buyers like this we need to make more buyers don't like this we need to make less so the market is responding to those consumers the people who are buying yeah when you're buying a painting you don't consume it it still exists but we're using that term to mean the people who are buying then we want to look at things like profitability if something has little profit to be made those vendors don't really want to buy it if I'm gonna buy it for $100 and sell it for hundred and ten dollars that's only ten dollars to me but I have a store I have travel I have time not enough profit I don't want to buy that so we can look at certain forms of art that don't have much profit in them those might be discouraged and thirdly we could say that art is being curated by elites for example if we look at pop art in Korea we know there are certain talent agencies that are very famous SM Entertainment JYP who choose the young people who will be put into a band and the entertainment industry or the entertainment business the talent agency especially in the early years will choose the music teach them how to dance tell them what to dance decide which songs go on with these activities are curation it's not like a single person is in high school and makes a his own CD or recording and puts it on a radio station the radio station plays it and everybody loves it and then he makes his own CDs and he it doesn't work that way there are expert professionals that are choosing basically what you want to hear they're deciding what's available so we have this curation or selection process right so that's who chooses the art that is the end of this first piece and it was what 23 minutes sorry a little bit longer than I thought trying not to talk too fast now let's move into the second part of this video lecture here we're going to talk about selection ownership management and finance of cultural assets and activities in particular on this first slide I want to talk about three spheres or sectors for the selection ownership management and finance of cultural assets and activities activities includes things like events assets includes things like the museum and the things inside the museum basically the wider circle of culture that we talked about earlier and we can include heritage materials in here an old house we can include it in this sector so the three spheres or sectors would be the government which is often called the public but that's probably not a good label the market which we discussed previously meaning the commercial sector the buying and selling and that can include the buying and selling of tickets it's focusing on consumers and the third sector is the NGOs right the nonprofit organizations and volunteers and donators whether that be individuals who are volunteers and donators or whether that is corporate when the company sends their staff out to do some work or the company donates money so the volunteers and donators it doesn't matter if it's an individual or a corporation a big business that is the third sphere for selection ownership management and finance of cultural assets and activities So what are the economics of museums and festivals? Well the left column has the three key points that many people just don't think about. 
museums, festivals, special exhibits, uh, events, heritage buildings. Typically we think of them as asset rich. It means they have valuable things. And basically this is true also of many churches. And if I, I want to generalize, I could say the Catholic Church is filled with valuable things. Paintings, buildings. We talked about uh, the Notre Dame in France and the fire, right? They don't have money to rebuild it. They have all these gold and emerald and, and valuable things, crosses, chalices, it's a cup, but they can't sell them, but they have to take care of them, so they have these assets, so many assets, but actually they are cash poor, they don't have a lot of money that they can use to spend to do things, and that includes the, the asset itself, somebody has to protect it, it's a painting, it might need cleaning, it needs to be in a safe space, proper uh, lighting. They don't have the cash for that. So as we see the third item on the left, assets have costs. Cost to maintain, cost to store it if you're not showing it in public, or if you are showing it in public, certain kinds of facilities are better. And we need security, whether that be a police officer or electronic security. And probably we need insurance. There's a strong fiscal side here. Lots of assets that we can't sell or should not sell. Not much, not much cash and cost. On the same level, but on the right column here, we have cost and issues of staffing the workers that do things for museums and events we have professionals hmm why is that there we have volunteers and we have non-professionals and I'm not sure why volunteers and non-professionals are in this order doesn't matter Let's just fix it while we're here. Maybe I'll use this someday in the future. Control X. Up. Control V. Up. And professionals, non-professionals, and volunteers. We also have issues of architecture and adjacent amenities. People don't think about this much, but these things can influence whether people come. For example, imagine two museums with the same things inside. But one is a beautiful and historic building in a lovely and safe neighborhood with good mass transit to get you there, good parking if you drive there. The other museum is a boring box building with little and expensive parking, poor mass transit. Which one are you more likely to go to? If the contents are the same, architecture and adjacent amenities can influence where you go. Go to the city that has a lovely hotel and a lovely beach. Let's go to Busan to the museum or to the Busan International Film Festival where we can hang out on Hyundai Beach, the train's good, da 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 But if we have an international film festival in, let's say, Jeonju, it's much harder to get there. And there's not as many things to do there. So, architecture and adjacent amenities, lovely hotels, nice beach, good transit, these things can affect the economics of museums, and yet they might not have much opportunity to change that. So that's the overview of this section on economics of museums and festivals, special exhibits, exhibits and old buildings. Let's look into some details. First, staffing. Staffing means workers. 
when we talk about staffing, we're usually talking about people like the docents. That means guides. All right? The people who are knowledgeable and able to tell others about it. We're talking about administrators. We're talking about the facilities team. That's the people who clean the floors and maintain security and take care of the building and take care of the goods inside the building. We're talking about researchers, especially in museums. And we're talking about technicians. People who are expert at handling the related materials for this museum or exhibit or whatever, or event. Those costs are all dictated by, controlled by, a number of influences. For example, what are the local standards? In Korea, the standards may not be quite so much different. I'm not sure. But if we look at a place like the United States, we know that it's very expensive to live in New York and San Francisco. And so if you want to hire somebody to go there, you have to pay more. If he's working in Cleveland, well, cost of living in Cleveland is low. It's also not a very nice place to live. Let's say you're living in Pittsburgh, which is nowadays nicer than Cleveland to live in. Maybe somebody might take a little bit less to live in Pittsburgh, even though it costs a little bit more, because it's a nicer place to live. Both of those places are too far to just drive into New York, especially with traffic. And to get a job at a famous museum might affect things too, but let's say it's the same quality museum. And New York costs 50% more to live, you gotta pay them more. Okay? And that's at the top level and it's at the lowest levels. Many cities have laws about livable wages. For example, the minimum wage by the national government or by the state government. But also, there are rules or at least ideas about how much you need to live somewhere. So Seattle, Washington, Seattle, Washington, has a higher minimum wage than the state of New York. And the city of New York doesn't have anything different from the state of New York. So even though it costs much less to live in Seattle, if you are a low-level worker, if you're working at a pizza place or a hamburger place, you get paid more in Seattle than you do in New York. So we have these local standards, which are often considered as livable wages, but also include things like certain benefits. Those standards and livable wages are both things controlled by law, but also controlled by the basic economy. So there are standards that people set in their own mind, as well as what law can say. Secondly, we have competitive rates, which means if I control a museum in San Diego, my hometown, which is a very desirable place to live, it's big enough to have all the features, and not as expensive as some other places. If I'm trying to find top-level talent and I want to steal somebody from another place, I have to pay a competitive wage. It might be that I have to pay more than another place, or it might be that because where I live is so desirable, people will take a little bit less, but only a little bit less. I'll move from L.A. to San Diego, where the cost of living is about the same, but San Diego is such a nice place and L.A. is so traffic crowded that I'll take a little bit less. But not a lot, right? So uh, when you start rising to the top in the arts field, all these museums, all these events, they're all competing with each other. You want to hire a conductor, you're competing on a not only U.S. national level, but on an international level. And the same is true in Korea. There is competition within the country, and there is competition to bring in Koreans who have left the country, to bring them back to be the, 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 the conductor or the uh, music director of the Seoul Symphony. Right? So we have competitive rates. And as well, inside the city, let's say, for example, you want to hire a security guard. Well, your museum might be a nonprofit organization, but is somebody going to work there for less than if they got hired at a bank? 
well, you know, the banks probably pay a little bit more. So how much do you have to pay so that you get good people? You have to compete with other organizations. Museums are not exempt. Cities are not exempt. In Korea, there's a standard wage across the country. But in the U.S. and in most countries, there's not. And city A and city B can compete against each other to get talent. So competitive rates. Then we have union rates. You probably didn't think about museums and, and operas and things being union, but they very often are. So, if there is a music union in your city, then your opera or symphony may have to pay union rates. That's not only salary, but that includes benefits. But if you say, but we're small and we're, uh, we shouldn't be. Well, you know, the, the process of unionization is a process by voting. So you don't really get to control that. If you become a union shop with union workers, you have to pay union rates. There's no choice or they're going to strike. Next, we have the question of corporate or governmental norms. If your museum or event is owned by government, you may be required by government to pay certain rates. For example, certain staff from the city get transferred over to the museum for a year or two, and then they go back. Well, they're getting paid by the government rate. If your museum is owned by a corporation, and the corporation has standards, you may have to treat your staff based on those governmental norms. We know that Samsung owns a museum. Do they pay the same kinds of normal pay that they pay a regular Samsung worker? I'm not sure. But in many places, yes, they do. Finally, we're looking at the part-timers, which we can call supplemental wages. These are people who are students, or they're retired, or they're housewife, house husband, they're not the primary source of income for that person, right? Now some of them are going to volunteer, but a lot of them expect some kind of pay. It might be minimum wage, or it might be that you have to pay them meals or travel money or something, but there's some kind of cost associated with many staff. And along with this are non-wage staff a non-wage cost such as insurance. If a volunteer gets hurt at your event, you're going to have to pay. Well, you're supposed to have insurance and the insurance will pay, but you had to pay for insurance and in your insurance you have to say who's included. So there are costs, including non-wage costs, for your part-timers and volunteers. Okay, so what kind of revenues are we looking at? Revenue means money coming in. Well, most museums, most events don't make most of their money from ticket sales. Direct user income, the people who are using your material, that's not the principal source of income. Now, of course, if you're selling a, a, a painting, the buyer pays for the painting. Fine. If you are running an art gallery, well, the buyer buys something and you take your commission, your 20%, 25%, and the remaining 75% or 80% goes to the painting owner, right? So uh, a gallery or uh, something like that could be different. That's a private business. But for museums, and that includes old buildings open to the public, and, and festival events, very often the ticket sales are not the main source of money. Operas and symphonies, ballets, they cannot survive just on tickets. So we need other kinds of money. And one major source would be what we can call support revenues. Those are things that come from sponsors. And there's more that we'll talk about in a moment, but for the moment we're going to include most of those things as sponsors.
okay, people who are supporting the event without buying a ticket. For some museums, and, and especially in opera and symphony, there's the possibility of recordings or publishing. For example, a museum, they take photos of their great artworks and they put it in a beautiful book and they sell the books. Okay, so there's a possibility of money from recordings and publishing. Now we have two things that are a little bit different. A museum or a festival, exhibit, things of this nature, they often create revenue for the wider community, not for the museum, not for the event, but for the hotel that visitors sleep in, the restaurants that visitors eat in, the tourism sector in a wider scale. For example, you come one day and you go to the museum, and the next day you go to the uh, aquarium or the uh, historic village. Okay. So, other people are making money from the fact that we're having an event or that our museum helps to draw people in. In the same way, our museum is getting people because those other organizations are there, right? It's more interesting for a sole person to travel to Busan, where they can do three or four or five things, than it would be to go to, I'm sorry, Daegu. Daegu has fewer entertainment options than Busan. Now you could say, well, just jump on the train or jump in the car and go down to Busan. That's fine. But if we try to think a little bit narrower into neighborhoods, you know, where can you sleep in one hotel and go to one place and come back, go to one place and come back? Sleeping in Daegu and visiting uh, Gyeongju one day trip and Busan one day trip and the next day go back to Busan for one day trip, that's not quite as convenient as sleeping in Busan. So there's wider community revenues that are not directly tied to uh, our museum. But we don't make any money off that. On the other hand, there are external costs. For example, if I'm doing an event, Busan International Film Festival, there are going to be a lot more costs for the city, for example, there's more traffic. Traffic creates smog. That's a cost. Traffic creates frustration with the people who are there. It might cause people who would go to Busan. So, oh, this weekend's going to be really crowded. I'm not going to Busan this weekend. So we have those kinds of costs through traffic. Then we have costs of policing. We need more police on the street to direct people here and there. Okay. There are various costs involved, particularly in festivals, but also in museums. Now the question is, does the museum or exhibition have to pay those costs? And it depends. For example, if I go back to San Diego, my hometown, I say, well, we have certain conventions. We have a big convention center. And one of the most famous is Comic Con, uh, a comics convention. And for about 10 days, there are several million visitors to the city. It's a wonderful event. Or if they host a major event like uh, the All-Star Game for baseball or football, right? a college football stars game, or end of the season bowl. There's lots of tourists coming in, and there's lots of costs connected to that. Okay? Police. Now, does the Comic Con have to pay for those extra police? Well, no. Does the bowl game, when they bring in an extra 25,000 outsiders for one day, do they have to pay for extra policing? Well, yes. So it's a case-by-case -case basis whether the city says you're causing more cost to the city and we're going to charge you for it. Or you're, ca you're creating more cost to the city, but we're not going to charge you for it because maybe because you're going to create a lot of revenues with hotel nights or case by case basis. Different cities make different choices about different kinds of events. So we have these external costs which are not really revenues but with they're kind of a opposite to negative opposite to a revenue. In order to make the money we have to think about these costs. So how do we generate revenues? How do we make money? 
what could be some strategies. I have six pages of strategies here. The first theme is to differentiate, to make differences in the admissions fees. How much does it cost to go in? This is based on an economic theory called elasticity of demand. And you know elastic, for example, in your panties. You can stretch them, you can stretch them and unstretch them. That stretching is elastic. Elasticity of demand means that the demand, the desire, the want, increases and, de and decreases. And we have to match those increases and decreases. So, for example, time. If your museum is open from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m., that's 10 hours in the day. If you come in at 10 a.m. and you pay $10, and you can watch, you can walk around all day. But what if you come in at 5 p.m.? Now you have only three hours to walk around the museum. Should you pay $10? Or should you get a discount? So we might change the admission fee based on what time you come in. Or we might change the admission fee depending on what day it is. For example, Saturday and Sunday, people have more time. Lots of people don't work, students are out of school, so we could say Saturday and Sunday the price is ten dollars but in the weekday the price is seven dollars so people who have time in the weekday for example re uh, uh, housewives or retired people or people who are taking a vacation if you come during the weekday you'll pay less so we are differentiating the admission fee based on time by hour or by day. The next differentiation is by season. That could be summer when there's a lot of people on vacation we charge a higher price. Winter when there's much fewer people we charge a lower price because we want to bring in more people. Summer is already crowded we can charge more and people will pay it. That's that idea of demand. What people want and will pay for. So the season could be based on uh, four seasons could be based on vacation season could be based on Christmas season right. what is the seasonality the up and down by longer periods of time what is the seasonality for your business for your museum for your event we can talk about discounts for individuals individual discounts for example if you're a retiree uh, in Korea, you can ride the subway free if you're over a certain age, right? That's a 100% discount. Discounts for older people, discounts for students. We want them to grow up to love opera. So any children who come to the opera get a cheaper price. Or maybe we'll have a special Sunday afternoon show for students. Parents or adults can only go with a child. So if you know, one parent, one child. So we can have discounts for students. We could have discounts for children. How young is a child? Do they have to show they're a student? We can have discounts for groups. Group of five, group of eight, group... No. We can have discounts for residents. This is very common in Korea with public <coughs> museums and public parks. That if you live inside the city, you can enter for free or for much less. And if you're an outsider, you live outside the city, you have to pay more. <coughs> but this is also true, for example, at Disneyland. At Disneyland in California, certain times of the year, it's, it's the off season, it's the winter, it's when it's not so crowded, they will offer discounts to people who live in certain postal codes. Let's say you live in San Diego, which is about 100 miles, about 160 kilometers, about two hour drive. For two weeks in the winter, they'll give a special discount for people who live in the San Diego area. And then another two weeks, 
will be for people who live in the Fresno Bakersfield area, which is basically north of Disneyland, about the same distance. So we could have discounts for residents of certain areas. And we also have discounts for resale vendors. Resale, people who will sell it again. Ticketing agencies, right? Ticketing agencies have to make their profit. And they can't very well sell a ticket for more than its face price. If the museum costs $10 to enter, the ticket agency might sell it online for $9. So you have an incentive to buy the ticket, right? You can save 10%. That means the museum needs to sell it to the ticketing agency for $7 because they want to make 25% profit. All right? So resale vendors, ticketing agencies get discounts. We also have revenues from repeat admissions. Okay, we're differentiating. We're saying if you come, if you buy a one-day ticket, it costs ten dollars. If you buy a two-day ticket, it costs fifteen dollars. Let's say, right? It could be back to back, so Saturday, Sunday. Or you could buy a one-month pass for twenty-three dollars, and you can come three times, four times, five times, seven times, twenty-seven times. Or you could buy a one-year pass. And again, Disneyland offers a one-month pass, a one-year pass, and a, and a two-day pass. And many museums do too. Okay, so there's one area, and we're still going on differentiated. Okay, let's keep going. We can differentiate, again, based on elasticity of demand, for premium admissions. These, these are entries where we say, okay, wherever you go, you don't have to wait in line. Just show your card, and you go to the front of the line. Okay, there's no queues. Or the premium admission could be unlimited access. You can go everywhere. There are certain areas in the museum that other people can't go to. Maybe you want to go back and see the laboratory where they are doing maintenance on things. Or you want to go back and see backstage so you can see how the stage looks looking out to the, to the public. So premium admissions maybe have unlimited access or just better access, more access. I'm going to type in more or unlimited here. More or unlimited access. We can also have various additions or add-ons to the ticket. For example, you can buy a guided tour. And that guided tour could be with a human. So that might be a docent, we said earlier. It could be a recorded tour when I went to the uh, a museum in France what is it called oh gosh um, we bought a cassette tape that gave us a audio tour um, there could be carriages in big museums and big parks you could ride it could be a, a, like a, a little bus could be like a little train it could be a personal carriage um, and that carriage might include guided tour effects. Right? but So you don't have to walk so much. And those add-ons could include, again, buying individual limited access areas. So we mentioned that a premium ticket might include all or many limited access areas. But here we could say, well, here's five different limited access areas. Which ones do you want to buy? If you want to buy all five, that's a premium. But if you just want to buy one, all right. And another area would be complementary packages. The complementary packages are things that are not related to my museum or my exhibit, but they're kind of like a package deal. So, for example, maybe in my museum we have a coffee shop or a meal, uh, a diner, a restaurant. And when you're buying your admission ticket, you can buy a free meal comes with it or something like that this is the package we're talking about not going to the store to buy something that's a kind of an add-on um, complimentary package could be transit which could be uh, you buy a bus pass and you get the museum or at the museum or you buy it in advance online when you buy your your museum ticket you get a free pass to another museum or you get a pass to uh, mass transit, you get a uh, free parking. Okay, so there's lots of things we could bundle. Bundle is a Korean term. We could bundle or package together 
in our sales program. Other potential revenues include government subsidies. Ah, oh, everybody's looking for the money from the government. Well, there's two kinds of subsidies, actually three here. Uh, one is what the government gives you and one is what people give you. But we can break that down into three. So uh, the indirect government subsidy basically comes through people is an indirect subsidy from government where citizens make donations and the government gives those citizens a tax discount, a tax reduction. Uh, if I give money to a temple in Korea, some percentage of my gift I get to subtract from my income tax. Right? So there's a tax discount. That is an indirect government subsidy. The, go the government's not giving the museum money or not giving the temple money, but the government is encouraging people to donate. Uh, another type of government subsidy is a voucher where the government gives people coupons, tickets, cards to use for the arts. And let's say its value is $100. And you can use it any way you want. And we have these in Korea, Moonhwa, uh, something like that. Anyway, uh, it's not so different from the current coronavirus card, right? They're limited in use. So we can have arts vouchers. People can use for various things. It might be a voucher that's good for entry, and it's just, you know, here's five different things. You can go to two, or it could be worth a certain amount of money, and you choose which place you go, uh, and they scratch the money off, or they mark it so that you know, it's worth less. So in this case, the government is encouraging people to make use of the arts, but they're letting people choose which arts to enjoy. And the third type of revenue is what we call direct uh, subsidies or lump sum grants, where the government just gives money. Now, when the government gives money, there's two ways of doing it. One is a specific grant, and the other is a non-specific grant. Okay. The specific grant is usually the government gives money for an event. We're giving you $50,000 to support your opera's performance of Verdi. Or a specific grant could be we're giving you $50,000 for transportation costs to bring goods or performers from other countries to Korea. Now I'm involved in a teachers association and we just got a big grant. And it was limited to certain things. We can use it to print uh, program books. We can use it to pay for foreign speakers to come to our conference. I forget what else. But it's very specific. This, 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 this you can buy or pay for. And you can't pay for other things. So no, you cannot give uh, discounts to other people using this money. You can't use it as a general subsidy. That's different. The non-specific grants are the spend it as you like. There's no rules. And these are very important because what happens in many NGOs and events is we get money for this, we get money for this, we get money for this, but who's paying for administration? Who's paying for insurance? Who's paying for worker salaries? Is that all coming from tickets? Well, maybe that's not enough. So when we're getting money, especially from government, we're always looking for the maximum flexibility, the least specific possible. So a specific grant is limited to a particular event or a particular type of cost, and a non-specific grant is open to however you wish to spend it. We're still with government subsidies. This is not a type, this is a note. Why should the government give money to the culture and arts? Why do people care? Do people agree? Are they willing to use their tax money for this? Well, there have been studies, and these studies suggest that public support, public approval for these governmental subsidies is directly correlated with income and likelihood of use. 
correlated with income and likelihood of use. That is, people who have more money probably also pay more in taxes. In general, they're more supportive of seeing government money go to the arts, to culture, to events. Remember the, the idea of higher culture, higher arts, and how culture and art are supposed to raise, to lift up society? Well, the higher income people are more supportive of that idea. Lower income people are often less supportive because they are looking at what they feel is their more immediate needs. And similarly, and maybe related, people with a more likelihood, a higher likelihood of using it are more supportive. So, for example, should we give money to the Fine Arts Museum? Well, people who enjoy the museum and don't live too far want to go to the museum, they're going to say, yeah, give it money so that A, my ticket price is lower, and B, they can get more things. They can have more events. But people who say, I don't like museums, or I don't like opera, or I, n I don't go to the opera in Seoul because I live in Midian and it's too far, they're less likely to be supportive of the idea that we give money to those kinds of events, those kinds of functions, activities. All right, so higher income is more supportive and more likely to use higher interest in the thing, more likely to support. Other kinds of revenues include private grants. Now, we don't hear too much about foundations in Korea the way we do in the U.S. Foundations in the U.S. are basically organizations that have a bunch of money, often because somebody died and left the money and they give that money away for good causes and the foundation decides what is the good cause it could, uh, it could be the person who died decided what's the good cause so the, the cause could be to support the arts or it could be to support opera so if the foundation's cause is opera and you're doing jazz dance they're not going to give you any money right these foundations are designed to give away money, to support. They don't do much themselves because by the nature of the law, they're supposed to give away the money, not do too much themselves. So we have private grants. Those also can come from businesses. For example, uh, the, a company that every year they give certain amount of contributions in social tax or, or charitable giving and individuals who want to give money maybe because of tax issues but here when we talk about private grants we're not talking about a fifty dollar donation grants are usually a thousand dollars or more all right we're talking about bekmanan to chanmanans potential revenues also include sponsorships now sponsorships are fuzzy because uh, exactly what is a sponsorship sometimes government would give a sponsorship of an event. More often it comes from businesses. Uh, sometimes it comes from individuals. With a sponsorship, one key is we usually expect to see the sponsor's name somewhere. But they're listed as a sponsor. It's not an advertisement, which is the next level. Commercial advertising is where somebody buys the right to advertise their products or services. So if you walk into the museum and as you're approaching the museum, you see a sign for uh, Hyundai Grandeur, big sign, on the side of the building at the museum, well, that could happen in the U.S. Because the museum says, hey, they want to pay us Obek uh, Manan to put a sign up on the side of the building. We'll take that money. So that would be commercial advertising. Commercial advertising in the program book. You walk into a museum and you pay a dollar for a, a program book or and you open it up and on page four, uh, on page, the inside cover is a letter with a photograph and a Samsung logo and it says uh, Samsung is very pleased to be a supporter of the uh, Uljin uh, Crab Festival. And you turning it on page 8, 
there's a beautiful picture of a uh, Hyundai Grandeur and it's basically the same advertisement that you would see in a magazine so we've got both a sponsorship and commercial advertising similarly we can talk about matching funds these are usually grants but they have some kind of ratio uh, last week I made an offer to a teachers organization I said we need to do this I think it's important so I will do a 50 50 match whatever money you can get from individual members other members don't use organization money whatever money you can get from individual members I will match it up to this amount so it's doubling Whatever you get, I will double it to a certain level. So these kinds of matching funds, 50-50, sometimes it's 80-20, uh, that I will give 20% for all the 80%. You get public mana, and I will give ebay mana, something like that. These different levels of match, matching funds. And what it does is it helps the organization to go out to their supporters and say, hey, we have matching funds. Your donation goes further now your donation of omanan is now worth yukmanan right or your donation of omanan is now worth shipmanan because we have a match so now's the time to give so these matching grants it's a way to push the organization to draw more money from other sources similar we could have a lottery or a raffle a lottery you think of Lotto in Korea, a lottery is usually when you have uh, people buying tickets for the chance to be the winner of money. And a raffle is usually when people are buying tickets to have the chance to be the winner of a thing. For example, a new car. Let's say Samsung donated a new grandeur to my Uljin festival with the rule being that we have to sell raffle tickets only at the Uljin festival and we can sell any kind of tickets we want however much we want and at the end of the festival on Sunday afternoon the vice president of Samsung uh, 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 I keep saying Samsung is Hyundai isn't it okay anyway uh, Samsung uh, motors will come out and reach into the drum and dig out the winning ticket is number one two three four five six seven mr. Kim sang bup Kim sang bup is here some is here yes you're the winner of the new Hyundai grandeur uh, Samsung grandeur whatever it is okay so a raffle is usually for a gift lottery is usually for cash you think of lotto the lottery or the raffle could be managed by government. Lotteries are often managed by government. Or it could be managed by the organization, the private organization that's, that's holding the event. And that's more likely to be a raffle. Okay, we're almost done. We're down towards the end. Potential revenue strategies number six. Here we're going to talk about PPP and you've heard of public-private partnerships in your other classes but this one's a little bit different this one doesn't mean contracting with the private sector to deliver public services here PPP is referring to ways that the government can push the private sector to provide goods to the public right? pushing the government is pushing the private sector to provide goods to the public and I have two examples here example number one would be called a mandatory set aside to set aside to move something away so for example if I want to build a new big building the government could require the developing company to provide 1% of the budget or 1% of the assets 
to be dedicated, to be allocated, to be given to heritage, culture, arts. And as part of the negotiation, as this private developer is getting their license to build, that could be something like, we're going to build a small museum on the grounds, we're going we're gonna to spend money for art that will go on the grounds outside the building so when people walk by the neighborhood they see the art. We're going to build a kind of a park uh, near the building or we're going to donate one percent of our budget to a certain museum or a certain uh, event. Okay, so this mandatory set aside in order to get your license to build you have to make arrangement for some value to go outside of your commercial business development. Example number two is what I call a social tax. That is this idea that major companies need to sponsor events or whatever. Uh, I often give the example of professional sports in Korea and Japan. These teams are owned by corporations. Um, these corporations buy the team and they know they're not going to make any money. You could say it's good PR, but on the other hand, at the time these leagues were being created, in many cases the government was rather strong and they would talk to companies and say, you should do this. And the companies recognized that if they didn't, they could have bigger problems. They could have investigations, tax audits. So it was a kind of a pressure or that uh, companies feel like they need to do more inside the community where they do business. And it might not be anything pressured by government, it's just a sense, we're gonna corporate social responsibility, that companies are expected to be more than just making money in the communities where they work. So two kinds, and there's more kinds, but this idea that the private sector will provide benefits to the general public as part of their deal, their arrangement, their licenses, their agreements with government. So the government and the private sector make a partnership to provide a public benefit or public good. Very often that is tied to culture and historic uh, assets. So we got all these revenues. How do they come? Well, sometimes it's good old cash. We love those green paper you know, money. Deposit in the bank. Other times it can come as credit, meaning, for example, I have a big business, I run stores, and I tell the museum, okay, I run an uh, office supply store. All the office supplies that you need for your administration of your opera, here is a budget of 5 million won, all of the things that you need that we sell, we'll give you up to 5, 000, uh, 5 million won. So it's a kind of a credit, like a credit card or a charge card. Um, in the same way with a city, it could be a credit towards the things that a museum might have to pay for. The museum might have to pay for electricity, gas, water, uh, property tax. And the city says, no, we're going to give you a credit of 10 million won. All those things that you have to charge, that you have to pay for, just uh, we'll give you a discount. But when you go over 10 million, now you have to pay. It's not free. We're giving you this credit instead of cash. The other way payments are made is what we call in-kind. That means goods and services. And sometimes staff. So we're going uh, Samsung wants to support this event, we're going to loan you 25 mini cars so that your staff can drive around during this big uh, Busan International Film Festival. Your team needs transit, they need ways to move around, we're going to give you 25 cars for the time of the event. When the event is over, you give them back. Okay, That would be free use. Or we could say we're going to give you 25 cars from our corporate free fleet, all right? We have many cars that we use in our in our business, and we're buying new cars. 
we're going to give you our old cars that you can drive during the event and after the event you can sell them. So now that's a gift, right? That's not use, that's a transfer, that's a gift. We're moving it to you. And we can give you free or we can give you a discount. Okay, you need uh, you need food for your restaurant. We're going to sell you the paper products, the plates, the cups, the bowls, and the spoons, and all the things that your consumers will use. We're going to sell it to you for 40% discount. That's our support to you. So if you buy a lot, that 40% makes a big savings. Now be careful, because some other company might have much cheaper prices, and that 40% is not useful for you, right? Right? That 40% off of their price might not be your best price. So you always have to check. But they're offering you a discount on their products. So these in-kind gifts could be goods, things that you use. It could be services. It could be staff. So staff would be sending people over there. Let's say uh, we're going to send some company workers to help manage the traffic on your busy days. They're just going to work there for four or five days and dust that. Services could be that, well, we know you need cleaning because the city is going to charge you after your event if the beach or the place is so dirty. So we have professional cleaning company. We're going to send our team to go there to clean things well. Not just pick up trash, but to do professional cleaning, you know, sidewalk cleaning. We're going to provide our services to you. And we're going to do that for free, or we're going to do that for a discount. So in-kind payment means anything valuable that's not cash or is not a credit that's the same as cash. Right? Credit basically means cash but only good at my store. It's like getting a coupon at Lotte department store. You cannot spend it at Emart. You can only spend it at Lotte department store. Okay. Our last slide for today is about pure privatization. Privatization or pub, uh, private sector ownership of the heritage of the old building, uh, the old uh, ceramic bowl that you found, uh, or the museum, private ownership of museum or private ownership of an event. How do we negotiate that in our world of culture policy. Well, the first thing is the city, the province, the national government, they should have some rules. And those rules may be regulation or they may be licensing. Regulation basically says what you can and can't do. Licensing is, well, you can only do it if you have a license and probably that costs money. Probably that costs money. Right? So the first rule with private sector involvement in culture for culture policy, the first rule will be regulation or licensing. The second area is incentives, and we've been talking about this numerous times this semester. Why would the private sector get involved in culture if we assume that they're not making a profit? All these things go out the window if I can make a profit. If I can run a museum without any government support and make money, that's great. You know, That's Disneyland. It's not exactly a museum, but they're making money. So what are, what are our incentives? Well, the first would be a tax incentive. Property taxes, that's a discount, right? Income taxes, investment tax credits, if you buy something, and the price goes up and you sell it later you might still get some kind of tax credit especially if the price goes down another way is financing or co-financing of improvements you bought an old building you bought a museum and you want to maintain it but you need some help okay the building is falling down the uh, painting that you bought is damaged and we all agree that it is a national asset, it's a national treasure, it's a painting, uh, it is a uh, 
cup. It is an old box from uh, you know, Joseon time, a clothing box, whichever. The government says, okay, we're going to help pay for it. It's yours, but it's so important that we're going to help pay for it. And so that co-financing of improvements to upgrade it or major maintenance, that co-financing could be through tax credits or it could actually be cash or it could be the government says, take it to this place and we're going to pay this much and the rest is your burden. Or your building has damage, well, we're going to send our team there, a company that we work with, is going to go there and do the work, but you're only going to pay this much. We're going to give you this much discount. Or when you pay for the repair of the building or repair of this product, when we have approved it first, then we're going to give you a tax deduction. Or, or uh, we're going to give you uh, some payment after the fact. All right. So that is our discussion today on the topics I lost my page. Topics related to heritage, selection, ownership, management, and finance. Okay. Not just the three spheres, but selection, ownership, management, and finance of cultural assets, which is more broadly defined here. Examining historical and cultural museum asset event festivals selection finance ownership and management uh, that's all for recorded lectures for this semester I've enjoyed the semester with you um, thank you very much